doesn't it bother you? That all anyone talks about when they talk about you are the seven husbands? No. Because they are just husbands. We're in Matthew chapter 22 this morning. And last week, if you were with us, we went through uh, an account here where and Jesus was dealing with those uh, in the group of the Pharisees that were attempting to publicly discredit him in front of everybody by asking the toughest question their brilliant minds could possibly think up. And it was a question that fell into the category of politics. And if you remember, it was uh, trying to entangle him in his answer, and it didn't work. But it was nonetheless an attempt, and this week it's more of the same. A few slight variations this week from last week, but uh, one of the differences that we'll see is the category that the question itself falls under. Last week it was one concerning politics. This week we're dealing with a question that Jesus faces concerning doctrine. Doctrine. Now to begin, <clears throat> I've told you before and I'll remind you again that a parable is a fictional tale that helps the storyteller prove a point, okay? Just a, a story of some sort that's used to prove something. And we've seen many parables in Matthew's gospel. And Jesus now isn't the only one who told them. Uh, this morning we read that it's somebody else's turn. It's the Sadducees now who have come to Christ in verse 23 that same day. It's the Sadducees who say that there's no resurrection. They came and then they pose their silly parable. We are told that it's the same day, uh, which means that this is the same day as the one that we read about last week and the one that was there the week before. In fact, if you want to find out when the day started, you go all the way back to chapter 21, verse 23, when Jesus made his way into Jerusalem and came into the temple, it says in, in that chapter, uh, the chief priests and the elders of the people confronted him as he was teaching, and they said, by what authority are you doing these things, and who gave you that authority? And they're referring to the things that he had done the day prior, which was to come into the temple and clean house. He flipped over tables and drove the money changers out with great assertion, if not aggression, and they want to know now on the following day, who give, what gives you the right? And that began a day that followed with uh, many parables, and Jesus is continuing on teaching and, and um, all the rest. And so here come the Sadducees now in our text this morning, and they're there to question Jesus' authority. And, and it's uh, these Sadducees, and I'll talk about who they are in just a moment. Uh, but Jesus is coming at them with a series of parables. All the parables, one, two, three, were skillfully uh, presented to condemn them, and they, of course, didn't like it. The Pharisees had had enough, and they left and went to convene somewhere else, sent back some delegates and tried to entangle Jesus, but that backfired. And so now it's that same day the Sadducees are going to step to the plate, take a shot of their own, and these guys are very eager to prove their point. They have a long-standing issue over the resurrection. And uh, before we get to that, let me tell you about who the, uh, the Sadducees were. Um, this was a group in Israel at that time that was very wealthy, extremely rich. They were very powerful and influential, and they were also very liberal. <clears throat> uh, add to that that there was few in number. There wasn't a whole lot of Sadducees. In fact, you read through the Gospels. Uh, we haven't read much about the Sadducees up to this point in Matthew's Gospel. Uh, lots about the Pharisees. They were greater in number. Uh, the Sadducees were the minority, but even though they were the minority by headcount, they actually were the majority in the governing body of Israel. The Sanhedrin is the title of that governing body. It was composed of both Pharisees and Sadducees. Uh, each of who held their own views on certain things and many times opposed. But it was the Sadducees who held the majority of those seats. Uh, the chief priests, when you read of that in the Scriptures, were Sadducees. The high priest was a Sadducee. And so they ruled the people. They held a lot of power, uh, but they didn't represent the people. Now, you can think about this in terms that perhaps you can understand a little bit better. This would be like 
uh, very wealthy, very powerful, very liberal uh, uh, rulers or, or uh, uh, politicians holding the majority of the seats in the Supreme Court. Okay? You can imagine what that would do to a country if they were passing their laws, pushing their agenda. It explains how that can happen when the numbers are so few. Because I'll tell you that um, our country, though those who believe that, say, uh, juveniles should have the right to choose their own gender and uh, undergo treatment without parental uh, uh, consent uh, are very few, um, they've done a number on our entire culture. I mean, you got just the average individual thinking that, that, that that's, that's good, that should be the case, even though in our conscience we're screaming, no, that's not right. And so, just so you know, it's very possible for just a few people with enough power and enough money to push an agenda. And that's exactly what was happening with the Sadducees. Uh, they ruled the people, but they didn't represent the people. Uh, they had very different views and very different ideals than the cultural norm in Israel at that time. The Jewish people as a collective, and this included the Pharisees, they believed in the supernatural. They believed that God was able to do things. They believed in angels. They believed in miracles. Uh, the general public believed in an afterlife. They believed in the resurrection. But the Sadducees denied it all. They were very materialistic. And now let me ask you a question. Can you blame them? Can you, can you blame those who in this life are extremely wealthy and extremely powerful? Can you blame them for denying the supernatural? Who wants to believe in God who really stands to threaten my riches and my wealth and my power? Who, who wants to really admit that there's a God when that God is ultimately my rival? I'm trying to build heaven on earth. I don't care about heaven. I don't want to think about the afterlife. The afterlife doesn't entail anything pleasant for a guy like me. And so they didn't believe in any of it. In their culture, they were winners. They were on top of the pile, right? Rich, smart. They were secure. They were very influential. Who wants heaven when earth is so good? Who wants anything to do with the afterlife when this one is so wonderful? A man named Robert Rayburn says, it's often those who are most comfortable in this world who have the greatest difficulty believing in the next. Now, that might include some of us. You say, well, I'm not rich. By comparison, you are. You got a job and a house and food in your cupboard, let alone on your table at night. You're doing better than a lot of others in this world. Probably the majority. And, and so Jesus told us, and we've all heard this one before, it's hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. It's really hard. And that would be then the Sadducees. Now, the reason they denied resurrection in particular, and they denied everything supernatural, right? Miracles, angels, afterlife, all that. But the reason they denied the resurrection in particular is because there wasn't, in their view, there wasn't sufficient evidence of it in the Torah. You know what the Torah is? It's all, it's, or the Pentateuch? It means the same thing, Torah and Pentateuch. It's the first five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, they were all compiled by Moses. They believed in the five books of Moses, the Torah, and were somewhat skeptical about the rest of the Old Testament. Okay, the prophets and the poetic books and the wisdom literature and all that kind of stuff, the historical, they, that to them was iffy. And so they really believed in the first five books of the Bible, and they didn't think that any of the writings of Moses had sufficient evidence to prove a resurrection. And so what the Pharisees thought about the resurrection is silly. And Moses didn't believe in the resurrection, so we don't believe in the resurrection either. So they held to those first, or the Pentateuch, or the Torah. That was their Bible. They were skeptical of the rest of it. If I could put this in other words, um, they only trusted a fraction of God's word. Okay, That was the Sadducees. Only 25% of the Bible that was available to them at that time was, in their eyes, to be trusted. So they, they really threw out 75% of God's word. And let me say this to you this morning. You cannot do that. 
You don't get to pick and choose which parts of God's word you adhere to and which ones you ignore and still hope to be a healthy person. Nobody gets to do that. Even though you might count yourself as a Christian, your whole life, because you deny 75% or fill in the blank, whatever percentage that is, if you deny any of it, your whole life is a mockery of the teachings of God. We believe in Scripture and all of Scripture, or we reject it all. And by the way, you can be 99% confident in God's Word and 1% disbelieving. And what does that make you? Unbelieving. And at least that. And what do you think God has a problem with? All the stuff you agree with or the stuff you reject? See, because the Sadducees and the Pharisees both were accurate in some of it. They believed in some of the scriptures. They at least believed in 25% of it. And it's not working out so well for them. They now have come face to face with Jesus the Christ, the Son of God, who has a few things to teach them about their doctrine. So in verse 24, they come <clears throat> with a silly little parable saying, Teacher, Moses said, see now they're reaching into the Pentateuch, the Torah. It says in the first five books of the Bible, Moses did, that if a man dies having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up offspring for his brother. That was actually found in the Bible. It comes out of Deuteronomy chapter 25. Verses 5 and 6 of that chapter say, If two brothers are living together on the same property and one of them dies without a son, his widow may not be married to anyone from outside the family. Instead, her husband's brother shall marry her and have intercourse with her to fulfill the duties of a brother-in-law. The first son she bears with him will be considered the son of the dead brother so that his name will not be forgotten in Israel. And the reason this was written into Scripture was because, you remember, God gave them this promised land, and God allotted that land to certain tribes and families. And once you received that inherited land, boy, you didn't want to let it go. It was meant to stay in your family for generation after generation. Well, a hypothetical situation comes that God foresees happening where perhaps... A man and woman were married but never had a son. Well, then he dies. What happens now? Does the property go up for auction? They lose that forever? Like, what, what are we going to do in that scenario? So God says, and he inspires Moses to write this down in Deuteronomy chapter 25. If that ever happens, then she should marry the guy's brother. This, this next of kin kind of idea. And we see that played out like in the book of Ruth. Really, really illustrated in the book of Ruth. But of course, the Sadducees didn't really buy the book of Ruth. So it's in Scripture in more, than, more, more places than just this. But they've got more to add to it. They're like, hey, what if she marries and then they don't have kids and then the brother marries and they don't have kids and then another brother and another brother and another brother and another brother and another brother. So they go on, oh, there was with us seven brothers. The first died, in verse 25, after he had married, and having no offspring, left his wife to his brother. Likewise, the second also, and the third, even to the seventh. And last of all, the woman died also. Therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife of the seven will she be? Because they all had her. <laughs> you can imagine them like, what do you think, Jesus? And <clears throat> what's up with that woman? I don't know. She got, you, you firing through that many husbands. If I'm seventh, I'm like, You know, if the grave could talk, I'd be speaking with my brothers about this one. But it's, it's a, a, an absurd scenario. Now, they say, if you look back uh, in verse 25, they said, Now, there were with us seven brothers, as if this was an actual account. Um, I don't know. That's hard for me to believe just because of the sheer chances of it happening. Uh, not to mention the fact that research tells me that, that that custom at that time had fallen into disuse. 
so that this wasn't even expected anymore, let alone practiced. So they've got this scenario, and, and they, well, there was this time when we had with us seven brothers, and, you know, so, so now what's going to happen there, Jesus? Um, as if it actually had happened. I'm not sure that it had. And by the way, let's not forget that these men were plain evil. Right? They're trying to entangle Jesus. That's not a polite thing to do. That doesn't speak well of your character or your heart or anything. These men are evil. There's no reason to believe that they were being honest here. Even if this was a real-life scenario, they obviously didn't care because they didn't believe it mattered in the end anyway. And yet, here they come with their question. This is a, a silly thing to ask, but they do only because they want to put Jesus in a pickle where they can publicly humiliate him and discredit him in front of the crowds. This is a question that they had probably, if I may, used already on other occasions to prove their point and hadn't up to this point received a sufficient answer, and so they just kept on using it. They just stumped the Pharisees every time they were, hey, so here, the seven brothers, and then uh, they all die. So whose wife is she in the end? And all the Pharisees are fumbling going, well, I don't know, but you know, whatever. And so the Sadducees then would be like, <laughs> told you, because you can't answer my question sufficiently. I get to go on believing stupid stuff. And you know how many people out there play that game with Christians? They're going to peg you and, and ask you stupid questions that if you can't answer them sufficiently, then they win the argument and go away continuing to believe nonsensical things about God that aren't remotely true. You know what one of them is? You've probably heard this before, and maybe some of you have even used it. If God's so powerful, can he make a rock that he himself can't lift? It's cute, isn't it? And people do that. I've been asked that question. And my answer always, 100% of the time is, you're stupid. And then I walk away. And it doesn't really do anything, but it feels pretty good. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I don't do that. <clears throat> I try to give them a sufficient answer, um, but generally speaking, they're not after an answer. They're asking that question to prove a point, to discredit you and your religion. So they come with this question, and I love Jesus' response. Verse 29, you're wrong. <laughs> That's how you, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you are mistaken, you know. You're wrong. So here's this thing, Jesus, you know, we had this guy who was living with us, seven brothers, and they all died, and you know, we're just wondering, just an innocent question, uh, who's she going to be married to, you know, in the resurrection? And Jesus goes, you're wrong. Why? Because you don't know the scriptures. You know why else? Because you're ignorant of, of the power of God. That's why you're wrong. It's a brilliant answer. It, it should put them in their place. I don't know that it will, but, you know, some, some people won't ever be put in their place. <clears throat> but he says, you're wrong because you know neither the scriptures or the power of God, for in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage. But uh, they're like the angels of God in heaven. Notice how he throws angels in there? They didn't believe in angels either, right? So he's like, doesn't matter. There's no, there's no, there's no marriage in heaven, but there are angels. <laughs> So Jesus is striking back at the core of their beliefs. But he says, you're wrong because you don't know the Scriptures. They did know the Scriptures technically, right? I mean, they knew enough to come out of Deuteronomy 25, right? Deuteronomy 25, verses 5 and 6, the part I just read. They knew what that was, but I'll bet if I quizzed anybody in this room and you could have quizzed me last week, I wouldn't have known what to, Deuteronomy 25, 5 and 6 said. So what I'm saying is they knew the Scriptures probably better than we do. And yet Jesus goes, you don't know the scriptures. Your knowledge of them is entirely superficial, and that's your problem. So you got to wonder, is the knowledge that we do have of scripture shallow and insufficient? And maybe that's our problem. you got to wonder how many of the problems that we right now face in our life stem from an insufficient knowledge of God's word. Because theirs did. Maybe ours do too, you know what I mean? And so Jesus says, <clears throat> you don't know the Scriptures. Well, they did superficially, but knowing some verses in the Bible 
made them no more familiar with the God of heaven. You could memorize the Bible cover to cover and still not know God. Did you know that? And Jesus doesn't take kindly to that, and so he rebukes them for it. And Jesus said, or God said, if you want to be more broad about it, in John chapter 5, you study the scriptures so diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. The very scriptures that testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me and actually receive eternal life. So there you are studying your Bible, learning the Bible, reading the Bible, memorizing the Bible, and you still don't know the God of the Bible. So it's possible to pour yourself into the scriptures and memorize them and study them and even treasure the scriptures. Oh, they're wonderful for me. And I have them on my coffee cup and I have them on the thing that my grandmother embroidered. It's in my kitchen and um, I've got some other verses somewhere. I love the scriptures. You could do all of that and never experience the effect that God intended for those scriptures to have on you and in your life and in your heart. And so I wonder if this passage exposes in us the same thing that it did in the Sadducees that day, which is that we, like them, tend to weed out certain passages of God's Word that we don't like. And I wonder if this is one of them. If you're paying attention, Jesus said, he just said, there's no marriage in heaven. And that makes some of us in this room balk. Some of us who are married, we don't like that verse. Some of us who aren't married yet don't like that verse either. There's no marriage in heaven? What the, you tell me that there's no marriage in heaven? Well, we can't imagine a life without a spouse. Or, get this, by implication, everything that comes along with having a spouse. <laughs> right? We can't imagine life without that. And so what do we do when we come to verse 30, when Jesus says, there's no such thing as that in heaven? What do we do with it? Are we going to believe him? Are we going to form our doctrines based on this truth? Or are we going to, like the Sadducees, weed that one out? See, now we've gone from believing the Bible 100% down to 99. And how far will we go with that? The, set, the Sadducees, these were entirely materialistic individuals and they don't like this answer, and they never liked it because um, Jesus' answers, Jesus' words don't appeal to the flesh like some religions do. There are some religions, by the way, uh, Islam, for example, is one of them, and I pick on Islam because it's duped a lot of people into believing that it's true when it's not. Um, but Islam, for example, bribes its men with an afterlife that offers 70 virgins. Well, that appeals to the flesh. So there we go. But you know who inspired that doctrine? Demons did. Demons inspired that Islamic doctrine. Why? Because Satan assumes that every man in his flesh secretly wants about six dozen sex slaves and that Jesus doesn't even offer marriage. So which one are you going to pick, boys? If you're picking in the flesh, I know which one you'd rather have. And where does that leave the women? <laughs> I mean, sounds like a real fun afterlife for the gals, doesn't it? But Jesus fires off the truth and says, I don't know if you're going to like this or not. There's no marriage in heaven. But it's a fact. It's a fact, but sometimes biblical doctrine is hard to swallow. Ask the Sadducees. But suffice it to say, it's really difficult, if not impossible, for some people to imagine living forever in a realm where marriage and everything associated with it is taken away. <clears throat> and there's a lot more to it than just sex, right? The thrill of falling in love. How many of you enjoyed falling in love? Have you ever fallen in love? It's kind of fun. How about the satisfaction of intimacy and companionship? I like that, even apart from the sex, just the companionship and the, just having somebody in my life that knows me deeply and I can know deeply. I mean, she knows stuff about me I'm never going to share with you guys. I need to have somebody like that in my life. I can't imagine not having that. Or romance. Some of you guys like romance, don't you? The girls 
the girls do, don't they? I mean, girls like romance, don't they? They do? Okay. Yeah, Seth said they did. <laughs> and so that goes away, okay, let alone the, the pleasure of physical sex. Okay, so whether you're married or not, what Jesus is telling us here might bother you, and if it does, <clears throat> the Holy Spirit might be revealing in us our own ignorance of God's Word, our own disbelief in His power, okay? If, 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 if verse 30 gives you pause, then you might doubt God's power, His power to actually give you love and joy and security and all the wonderful things that marriage affords beyond the marital relationship. What if God is able to do that? What if heaven is a place where the intimacy that you ever enjoyed with your spouse pales in comparison? Uh, or, or the pleasures of sex? Uh, what if God is powerful enough to make available greater pleasures than any of those that are found in matrimony? Why would we doubt his power? Are we too, like the Sadducees, ignorant, not just of Scripture, but also of the power of God? Where is our doctrine? What do we actually believe? Do we believe that God wants to just take away everything fun and enjoyable? Is that the God you believe in today? That he's just created an eternal realm for you whereby he can deny you of everything you ever enjoyed? That sounds like hell, I think. That's not heaven. God created pleasure. He's, he holds the patent on sex and everything else. So it's for us to enjoy. Don't you think that he could, if he's capable of designing sex, design something else that makes sex seem trite? I think we're sometimes too immature to conceive of a life that doesn't include all the material things that we hold so dear in this life. I'll give you an example here. This will hopefully help you kind of understand where my mind is at. <clears throat> when I was a kid, like a lot of little boys, I liked Tonka toys. Do you know what Tonka toys yeah. do are? Do does everybody know what Tonka toys are? All the guys are shaking their heads. <laughs> you know what a Tonka toy is? Do you? I'm looking at you. Yes, do you? No. Okay. I gotta explain. It was um, really big metal dump trucks and backhoes, you know, and all the stuff that cat makes, you know, like it was the best. You had bulldozers and everything you could imagine that made a sandbox awesome. And I had some. I mean, I had a, a dump truck and I had a, an 18 wheeler and a, and a backhoe and all these things. <clears throat> and so now, if somebody would come to me and said, my, let's just say, my father, my father, not the one in heaven, but my earthly father. Let's say my father came and said, son, there's going to come a day, not too long from now, when your life won't have Tonka toys in it anymore. All your dump trucks, all your backhoes, all that kind of stuff, you won't have it anymore. And you can trust me, though. I'm not taking away those things. I'm just telling you, there's going to come a day when you won't even want them. So, not have been left going, a life without Tonka toys? That's awful. I don't, you know, I don't want to go there. I'm there now. <laughs> and God has replaced all of the wonderful things that I enjoyed in the sandbox with things that now I wouldn't trade away for anything. <laughs> things that if you would have told me when I was five, I would have been like, gross, girls, I won't be married. I'm not ever going to get married. I'm going to... Things are different. And I'm telling you, I don't care about dump trucks anymore. Call it age call it God's design. The Apostle Paul said, when I was a kid, I played with Tonka toys. Or, I thought like a boy. I acted like a boy. I talked like a boy. I played with Tonka toys. But when I grew up, I became a man and I put away those childish things. And Paul wasn't crying about it. And neither will you. To live in an eternal state where there is no marriage isn't going to bother any one of us a bit. 
Whether there's anything up there that we remember from down here, I'm not too worried about that. Let, let your doctrine include the power of God to make you there into something you're not here so that even if verses like these make you go, oh, I don't know if I like that, you know, heaven sounds a little less pretty right now. Don't do it. C.S. Lewis once said, the Lord doesn't think our desires are too strong. He thinks they're too weak. We're half-hearted creatures, fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered to us, like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he can't imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. He says, we are far too easily pleased. Right? We would all admit that with all of our Tonka toys and Barbie dolls, wouldn't we? Yeah, we were far too easily pleased. But now we're grown up and we have big boy toys and big girl toys and we don't want to let go of those. We're far too easily pleased. What C.S. Lewis is saying is even the things you enjoy the most right now is mud pies compared to what God offers in heaven. So let's trust the Lord. Let's trust the Lord because uh, these guys, the Sadducees, were full of immaturity and distrust. May it not be said of us as well. And so... Jesus now is going to quickly move past that first question, the riddle, the parable. Hey, what do we do with the seven brothers? And Jesus goes, oh, you don't even get it. There's no marriage in heaven. That's the answer. And then he continues and says, but, in verse 31, but concerning the resurrection of the dead, now they weren't asking about the resurrection of the dead. They were asking about marriage. Who gets the girl? And Jesus goes, uh, nobody. But you got deeper problems than just that one little riddle. We still haven't taken care of your doctrinal error. So, concerning the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was spoken to you by God? And I, Jesus, how many times has he done this? To the Pharisees and or the Sadducees? Just, ugh, haven't you ever read the Bible? Because they were the experts. That's what they did all day, every day, was read the Bible. And Jesus goes, you should pick one up once. You ever read the Bible? Have you never read what was spoken to you by God when he said, quote, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, end quote. God is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. And Jesus goes, so there's Exodus chapter 3 for you. I just quoted it. You know it. It comes from your Torah. So I'm teaching you on your grounds. I only took from the first five books of the Bible. So you know this verse. Have you never read it? Have you never thought about the implications of what God is saying there? I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And by the time he said that, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had been long dead. And God goes, I'm still their God. And if I'm still their God, then they are able, where they're at right now, of worshiping me and obeying me, which is what people do when I'm their God. They ain't dead. They're still alive. So Jesus proves his point in a way that leaves them all going. <laughs> like verse 33, when the multitudes heard this, they were astonished at his teaching. I think you could almost hear the crowd go, ooh, because they were on the Pharisees' side and Jesus just slammed the Sadducees with one quick verse. And I'll bet you they just went, <laughs> you know, they're slapping each other on the back and pointing. And so Jesus takes care of it all in one fell swoop. He proves the reality of the resurrection by quoting Exodus 3, and he proves that resurrection was taught in the Torah all along. They just weren't seeing it. Now they're forced to eliminate even more of the 25% of the Bible that they said they believed. Either that or change your doctrine. You pick. Jesus does that to you. We all say we're Christians here. Do you believe the Bible? Yes. Do you, be do you believe that the Bible is authoritative and inerrant? You know, like without flaw. Yes, of course. Do you believe in all the Bible, the whole Bible and nothing but the Oh, yo, yo. Okay. God heard that. And what he's going to do is he's going to orchestrate your life to put some of that doctrine to the test. 
That's what doctrine is for, to get you through life. So, it's pass or fail. You say, I believe in the whole Bible. Okay, do you believe the part about fornication? It says a fornication is sin, premarital sex is sin. Do you believe that? Any of you who are pursuing a relationship with somebody, you're going to be put to the test. Well, I believe that drunkenness is a sin. Yeah, well, because that's what the Bible says. So do you really believe that? I believe that excess is unwise. I, I believe that, okay, then are you living in excess? Right? Because that's what the Bible says. Proverbs. Honey is good, but too much of it, it's going to make you sick. You know what that means? Excess isn't a good idea. So, but we are American. Oh, we believe that excess is okay, right? Supersize me. In all categories. Well, your doctrine is going to be challenged sooner or later. I promise you. Just as the Sadducees' doctrine was challenged. The reason that Jesus is so intent in correcting their doctrinal error about the resurrection and the reason that Jesus is so insistent on correcting any doctrinal error that you or I might have is because doctrinal error always results in further problems when it comes to practical application. The reason they weren't getting it right about marriage and the reason they had silly assumptions about marriage is because their doctrine was wrong. And the same is true of you. If you are holding on to any doctrines that aren't accurate, it's going to bear its own fruit. Look behind the problems that people have in life, whether that be their marriage or their finances or sometimes even health. You're going to find oftentimes doctrinal inaccuracy. These guys were clinging to wrong beliefs and wrong teachings and wrong doctrines, and it made them impossible to rightly apply the scriptures of Christ. <clears throat> now, the Sadducees, as a, as a group, they um, kept their doctrinal views even after this run-in with Jesus. It says that they were astonished at Jesus' teaching, the whole multitude was, no doubt the Sadducees were as well, astonished, but again, they didn't repent. It says how they reacted with astonishment, but there's nothing in there about repentance. And so we know that the Sadducees kept their doctrinal views because the Bible shows us that 30 years later, they were still the same just sour and sinful and doctrine-mocking people that they ever were. Uh, did they change their views on the resurrection? No, they didn't. Acts chapter 23, I'll just read a passage to you. Paul is being tried by the council, <clears throat> these people, including some Pharisees. And it says, intently looking at the council, Paul said, Brothers, I've lived my life before God in all good conscience up to this day. And the high priest Ananias, that would be a Sadducee high priest, commanded those who stood by to strike him on the mouth. So they smacked Paul across the face. And then Paul said to them, God's going to strike you. You sitting here to judge me according to the law. And yet contrary to the law, you order me to be struck. And those who stood by said, would you revile God's high priest? And then Paul said, I didn't know, brothers, that he was the high priest. You're right. It is written in the Bible. You shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. Now, which by the way, I, yeah, whatever. Uh, then Paul realized that one part were Sadducees and the other part were Pharisees. And so he cried out, brothers, I'm a Pharisee, a son of Pharisees. It's with respect to the hope of the resurrection of the dead that I'm on trial. He did that on purpose because when he said this, a dissension arose between the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the assembly was divided because the, the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection or angels or spirits, but the Pharisees acknowledge them all. So a great clamor arose. I mean, this is brilliant. Paul sees that, oh, they're, oh Sadducees, Pharisees. Hey, I'm on trial for the resurrection because I believe in it. 
and he just takes one step back and watches chaos ensue. It says, a great clamor arose, and some of the scribes of the Pharisees' party stood up and contended sharply. We find nothing wrong in this man. So now they're like, hey, he's not a bad guy. And then, what if a spirit or an angel spoke to him? And when the dissension became violent, so the Sadducees are not backing down. When the dissension became violent, that means, I think, punches were being thrown and teeth were being cracked. The tribune... Here's why I think that, because it says the tribune was afraid that, quote, Paul would be torn to pieces by them. And so they commanded the soldiers to get down there and take Paul away from among them by force and get him into the barracks. They thought that Paul was going to get killed by being in the middle of this fist fight. So it's obvious to me, and again, this is 30 years after Jesus confronted them, that the Sadducees weren't interested in backing down at all from their wrong beliefs. Oh, it's dangerous, isn't it, to be a Christian for as long as we have. How, how long have you been a Christian? Five years? Ten years? All your life? Because you know what? You've got doctrines. You hold to your doctrines. And you finally, out of all the hundred plus churches in Duluth, you finally found a church that agrees with you. This church doctrine is the right doctrine because I approve. And so you become very, very solidified in your doctrines. Unmovable, some people are. And yet, what are you going to do if Jesus comes and goes, you're wrong. You're mistaken. You know why? Because your knowledge of Scripture is superficial. And you don't experience the power of God in your life. And that's why. And you've got wrong doctrines that you won't let go of. And so 30 years later, they're more rigid in their doctrine than they ever were. And you know what's sad about that? They kept their religion. They still had their religion. Problem was, it was built on a foundation of false doctrine. And that's why they weren't happy with their life. That's why things were going wrong. That's why they weren't at peace with each other. And that's why they still didn't love God. Interesting data that I came across in my studies. On April 7th, 2023, so this is just three months old, a study found that there are some 200 different Christian denominations in America. 200 different denominations. That means 200 different varieties of Christianity that you have to sift through and pick from. And some 45,000 different denominations worldwide that are all available to you online. Well, they can't all be right. Denominations exist because the one they came from didn't jibe. They don't agree. And so factions, factions... Pharisees, Sadducees, scribes, Herodians, remember? Jesus has a lot of doctrine to correct. Acts 17.30 says, God calls all men and women everywhere to repent. All of us. So let me ask you, does the Spirit of Christ have the right to tell you to change your doctrinal position? Does he have the right to tell you to change what you think? Does he? We know what the answer is, or at least should be. It should be yes. Does Jesus have that right? Yeah, he should. Then when was the last time the Holy Spirit changed the way you do think about God's word? When was the last time you were confronted about what you believe, your fundamentals? Because if we're locked in, we're done. We got nothing less to learn. We don't need the Holy Spirit, do we? We got it down. All we got is our Bible. That's all we need. We don't need to change. Now, I tell you this morning that if the Holy Spirit is showing you any problems in your life, maybe some major stuff, stuff that brought you here today, but you're not willing to take a hard look at whether or not your long-held beliefs might actually be responsible for the problems that you're seeing in your life, then your future is predictable. It's the same future that we see in the Sadducees. Loneliness, they're alienated, few in number, heartbreak, strife and conflict, 
with your associates. That's the life of those who can't change and won't change for no one, not even Jesus. And take a look at what you believe. I, I would encourage you to do that. Yes, study your Bible. Yes, memorize your verses. But don't ever be so rigid in what you believe that you aren't allowing the Holy Spirit to confront you on some things.